This is Stephanie Lemelin, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Hello, team. Welcome back to Whelmed Reprints. It's the holiday season here in the States, so we'll be taking time to spend with our families and get ready for Season 3, premiering on January 4th, 2019. With Whelmed Reprints, our team are picking a few of our favorite episodes to bring to new listeners, and I wanted to end 2018 revisiting what turned out to be a life-changing interview for me. Caleb and I started whelmed after a friend of the show, Darcy Ross, started asking me about Young Justice during the live tweet of her first watch through. Caleb worked his tail off for six months, helping to get us over a dozen episodes in the can and ready to air. We got original art from Kevin Bates, music from Emily E. Mayo, and our first computer voice from the amazing Maddie K. Ray. We aired two episodes a week for a year, eventually bringing on producer Neil to help with the insane editing schedule. About halfway through airing season one, we found out that Caleb had impending life changes that were going to take much more of his time, so he wasn't going to be able to do season two. Caleb, I love you, man. Thank you for all you do and all you did to make Whelmed. About that time, a woman started interacting with us on Twitter, writing short essays about fan fiction, the romantic arcs, and Miss Martian. Her responses to our show were passionate, articulate, and polite. <laughs> and they changed my mind on a number of subjects. Listeners who follow us on Twitter started asking us to bring her onto the show for a discussion session, which we did, but I had another idea. I'd interacted with Emily quite a bit before we scheduled what you're about to hear. She looked at the show through a different lens than I did, but still analyzed it with a creator's eye. She was Robin's age when the show first aired, and it was her first exposure to DC Comics. When we interacted with her through email or on Twitter, she was responsive, professional, and responsible. Caleb, Neil, and I had a meeting, and I told him that if this interview went well, if she was as good on mic as I suspected she would be, that I wanted to ask her to be our second season co-host. And they agreed. Emily, thank you for coming on board. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for writing so many episode outlines and for cracking me up with your <laughs> hidden jokes. Thank you for your brilliant guest spots on other podcasts like Protean City, Party of One, She's a Super Geek, and your breathtaking voice work on Issue 18 of Nerds on a Roll. Thank you for taking this opportunity and making it your own. And thank you for saving Whelmed. In other news, we have just over a week until Season 3 airs. It's finally here. The first three episodes of Young Justice Outsiders airs on January 4th, with three episodes releasing weekly for two more weeks, and four episodes releasing on the last Friday in January. So how does that unique release schedule affect us? Practically, there's no way we can do three of our Whelm-style deep dives per week. So what we'll be doing is this, and huge shout out to Ben Schwartz for helping us think this through. The week after each Friday release... The week after each Friday release, we are going to let ourselves off the hook as fans. Emily and I will be discussing the episodes with a slight change to our regular format. We'll be doing very short mission briefings on all three episodes, or four, with a heavy emphasis on our Feeling the Astro segments. Canary debriefs will be skipped during these geek outs, and since we will have no material to spoil, any major speculations on what's to come will be couched in our Crashing the Mode segment, in case we happen to be right. <laughs> We'll continue to have our fan service segment as well, so please feel free to tag us on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook with fan art, AMVs, cosplay, photo shoots, and more. Then, after the mid-season finale, we will return to episode one and dive in with the perspective of all 13 episodes under our belt. This will allow us to release reviews of part one before part two airs in June of 2019. In addition, we have a lot of bonus episode material lined up, including discussion sessions with cast, crew, and fans, a list of new Secret Origins characters, the inevitable romantic arcs to feed Super Sweethearts, and a few other surprises. So, starting the second week of January, you'll be getting new episodes from us at least once a week. As for today, we hope you enjoy today's double-length collection and your ongoing holiday season. And remember, smoochy moments are important. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-1-2. 
are you? It's pretty cold where I come from. Oh, here. <laughs> Dude, mm. that's your sister! Mm. Today in the cave, we welcome friend of the show, Emily Buza. Emily studies both English and theater at Clark University, is a fan fiction author, and has been blowing our minds on Twitter with her analyses of character motivations, depths of relationships, and the speculations that poured from the fans during the show's actual original release. Since uh, 140 characters isn't enough to import everything from her mind into my own mind, I asked her to come on the show. Well, maybe I begged her a little bit. Emily. I'm so excited to welcome you to the cave. I'm so excited to be here. This is going to be so much fun. All right, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, heard, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with that, let's dive in. Okay, so I... First of all, I want to say that she's out Young Justice geeked me today because she's wearing her, her Connor t-shirt and my Nightwing t-shirt has too many holes in it. It was embarrassing. So now I've just got my Firefly shirt on. So well played, Booza. I touched on a few things in the intro, but uh, tell us a little more about who you are and what you do. And are, you said you were in like uh, practicing for like theater. You had rehearsals or something, right? Are you in a play soon? Oh, I am currently, yes, in a production of King Henry the Fourth, Part One. So that's one of Shakespeare's historical plays. And that's mm-hmm. so much fun. But you know, I've had to respond to a bunch of your messages from backstage because I'm there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Sorry. Interrupt the production. No, it's fine. It's fine. Whenever I'm on break, I'm like, oh, I have to respond to this. Right. But that's a lot of fun. And because I am an actress, as you said, I'm studying theater and English. So I'm also a writer. I read and write for fun when I'm not doing those same things for classes. And outside of that and everything else that you listed, I cosplay sometimes. I do crafts. I just do all of the creative things that I can possibly do because I can't settle on one thing. Fantastic. When you said that you were in theater, it made a lot of sense because I was like, oh, that's why you have these super articulate like insights into <laughs> things like the writing and the character motivations and things like that. I mean, I was impressed that you had them anyway, but the fact that you study theater made a lot of sense because you're going to be looking at these episodes and the character development and the dialogue and all of these things a little differently than just, you know, like a casual viewer. Yeah, definitely. Both theater and English and all of those things where you have to analyze all of the characters definitely help. When I watch shows and when I read things that I'm just reading for fun, I'm just like, okay, but let me just dissect all of this. And people are like, can't you just right. can't you just watch the show? <laughs> Does it really help or is it not helpful at all? There's probably times of both, right? <laughs> it depends because sometimes, sometimes yeah. it's like I can watch a show and be like, oh, that's so smart the way that they did that because of this and I'll understand like allusions to other stuff. But then at the same time, time you'll watch a show that people are like it's so fun and i watch it and i'm like all of this dialogue is just clunky exposition that's not how you do exposition (laughs) yes exactly it's it's a catch-22 it allows you to see the depth of how they do something and when they do something right and nail it you're excited for the writers and the directors because you're like oh good job but then you know you watch a movie and you can't just watch the movie and enjoy it anymore right yeah Sometimes you just have to you just have to turn it off. You have to turn that side of your brain off and be like, don't analyze it. Just just watch the fun movie. Just move on. It's so hard sometimes, though. Yeah. All right. Anyway, when did you first see Young Justice? I'm asking you when you first saw Young Justice because I ask everybody. But clearly it must have been during the original run because you were by based on some of the things you've told us, you were pretty involved in the fandom at the time. Yeah. Yes, I have been around since the first episode, since the rebroadcast of the first episode, because they showed it a few months in advance, and then they started showing it weekly as part of their like Friday night action block on Cartoon Network. And I watched it just on a whim, because at that point in my life, I was really into Ben 10 Alien Force that was part of the Friday night action block. (laughs) And I was like, "Eh, there's nothing else on. I might as well catch the superhero show that's before Ben 10. And then I immediately fell in love with it. And it became why I watched the Friday night action block. And then Ben 10 was kind of secondary. Oh, poor Ben. (laughs) 
but then <laughs> I was around for all of the hiatuses and all of the crazy yeah. time shifts and day changes and when it went from like it's a Friday night action show to it's Saturday morning cartoon now I'm like okay I'm still here I'll still watch it <laughs> right that's interesting to me because I bought the show on iTunes because we don't have cable in our house we just do the Apple box thing and so I knew that they'd switch the times that it had been released but I didn't realize that they'd shifted so badly and like it was on a Friday night like prime time and then it was on a Saturday morning it used to be for a long time back in the day on Cartoon Network they had this thing going that like Thursday night was new episodes of their comedy shows and then Friday night was new episodes of like their four main action shows it was like Ben 10 Alien Force Generator Rex Star Wars The Clone Wars and then Uh. it depended sometimes it was Batman the Brave and the Bold and then Young Justice got added to the block and then sometimes they had other shows that were rotating in that lineup was uh the green lantern animated series was that in that block folding into because that was releasing about the same time no because that ended up getting released i'm pretty sure if i'm remembering right it was a while ago that came out after it had been switched to a saturday morning cartoon that was when oh, they made the gotcha. dc nation block where it was like right green lantern and young justice and then like little 30 second one minute shorts on commercials that were dc related so green lantern came after they had made the switch to saturdays Gotcha, gotcha. But it sounds like you alluded to the answer to my next question, which was, what was your experience with DC or comics in general before you watched the show? Because you were like, oh, whatever, I'll watch this random superhero show. Did you were you not a comic reader before you saw the show? I was not a comic book fan before this. I knew about as much as anybody knows. Like I knew Superman was Clark Kent. I knew Batman was Bruce Wayne. I knew all of the random pop culture stuff. And I have an older brother and he watched Batman Beyond and stuff like that. So I knew some things. Um, And like I'd grown up with Teen Titans being on and around. So like I knew enough, but I was never into superheroes. Like to me at that age when that was coming out, I was like superheroes are superheroes are the boy genre like i watched things that were for Uh. boys i watched ben 10 but superheroes always felt like just for boys it was guys with powers punching each other it always felt like to me and then i watched young justice and young justice was like oh there are there are characters here there's a story you can tell with these characters and Young Justice was what made me go into a comic book store for the first time. The first comics I ever bought were the tie-in comics. I got issues 13 and 14, I think, were the first ones that I had that I ever bought. And I still have those. I still have the first comics I ever bought. As of us recording this today, today actually was the release of my chat with Christopher Jones, who did the comics as well. So we talked a little bit about the fact that Young Justice and the tie-in comics themselves were a bit of an on-ramp for people who had never experienced comics or, you know, at least DC before, right? Definitely. Like, it's amazing to me to hear that Young Justice is what got you into a comic book store, <laughs> like taking it that extra step. It did. Yeah. Like I had before I like the only real experience I had with comics was there was a series from Marvel called Runaways that was about like the teenage children of villains in LA. And I had like a trade paperback version of that, of like the first volume of that, that I'd found at Barnes and Noble. So I had like, that was it. Runaways being your first comic is (laughs) awesome. (laughs) Why don't you just dive on in to the deep end, you know? I was like, sure. I don't know who any of these people are. I'll just go with it. But it was, I loved that. And then with Young Justice, (laughs) I remember I'd like, For my birthday, I'd asked for the first trade paperback of Young Justice. So I'd read those first. I'd read like the first volume of that as a trade paperback. And then after I'd finished that and I'd loved it. And I was like, this is a monthly series. I can get this every month. I don't have to wait for this to be published in a paperback. (laughs) So I like found my local comic book store and like asked my mom one summer. So you know that teenage superhero show I watch? Can I, can we go to the comic book store? I need to buy the comic, please. And she's always been so supportive of me being a nerd because I'm from a family of nerds and we're all nerds about different things. She was like, yeah, sure. So I went and I bought them and then I went back every month to keep buying them for the rest of that run from issue 13 onwards. I was on board. I was like, every month I'm going and buying this because it's amazing. That's fantastic. Okay, so that again leads me into my next question, which was you had mentioned to me that you basically were doing scaled down versions of what we do in our show, but you were doing them in like, was it a personal journal? You just said it was a journal that you were doing it in. Was this, can you can you dive into that a little bit? Yes, it was my personal journals back from 
me being a young kid and I loved the show and I wanted some way to express all of the things I was thinking and feeling about the show. So I I had like my daily journal, like a diary like you keep or whatever when you're younger. And so I had sections of it where I just write, I'd be like, new episode of Young Justice was today. And then I'd write all of my thoughts on what happened and things that were going on because I saw people doing like YouTube reviews of the show. And I'm like, I can't do that. But I still have a lot of things I want to say. So I just wrote them for myself to write them and like talk to my friends about the show. But like nowhere near as in-depth as you guys because I don't have all the history and didn't have all the history back then, even though I was searching out everything I could find. (laughs) You're not old is the word you're looking for. (laughs) So I was writing about them in... I can't believe this. Wait. She's pulling it off her shelf. (laughs) She's pulling it off her shelf. I grabbed them last time I went home because I'd mentioned them to you. So I'm like, I need to find these if I have them somewhere. I had them buried somewhere in my closet with all of my old journals. And if I can find it, the one that I wrote for Terrors is like 30 pages long. (laughs) Nice. Because it was just me ranting about the episode Terrors because I loved it so much. That's huge. Yep. My writing was huge, but oh, it's that's also, fair. it was a lot. I had a lot of feelings about Terrors. It's made clear by the fact nice. that it ended with a screenshot of the first Super Martian kiss. She is that a, screen- a child. <laughs> Me, I was just like, they're the best. I need a visual reference in this for how much I loved this episode. Nice, nice. We're definitely going to dive into Super Martian a bit. Yes. Also, I'm going to uh, convince you to give us scans of those <laughs> and share them out to everyone. That's, They're that's gonna happen. nowhere near as good as the things you guys have done with analyzing. I am fascinated. So how, what age were you when you were doing that? When the show first I premiered, hate to ask. I was in, it was five, since it was five years ago, I was in eighth grade. I was a preteen. I was a little 13, 14. I was the same age as Robin. <laughs> I was a little 14 nice. year old me being like, I need to analyze this show. And it's just me ranting about everything I loved about every single episode. I so want a window into our 14-year-old, you know, (laughs) listeners and fans of watching the show. Because that's part of it too, right? Like Robin was 13 or 14, right? Yeah. Connor was, you know, biologically 16. I want to see like, how does that affect somebody who watches it? Does it help them connect to the show the way that I imagine it would? I think it did for me in some ways. Because like, if it had been a show about the Justice League... I probably wouldn't have watched it because I was like, well, they're adults and they're just a bunch of adults punching people was how 14 year old me interpreted it. (laughs) Well, when you put it that way, (laughs) it doesn't sound as inviting. Of course, there's so much more than that. And I know that now. But when I was 14, (laughs) I was like, well, maybe it'll be fun. They're teenagers. Robin's my age. Maybe I'll understand this. And since then, one of my favorite genres in comics is teenage superheroes and them working as teams. I love it. I love that dynamic dynamic of being like you have all of these people who are super powerful and they're all working together and they're also yeah. incredibly awkward and in trying to pass algebra i'm like that is an amazing right. combination right young justice led me to things like young avengers and x-men evolution and a bunch of these other shows and comics that were like what if yeah. we take a bunch of people that are all between the ages of 15 and 18 and just let them free and let them fight crime i'm like i will read that every day <laughs> nice That's fantastic. All right. So for those of you who aren't following us on Twitter, what would happen is we'd air an episode. Emily would let us know that we were mistaken about something. (laughs) I would say, wait, what? Really? That's interesting. And then she would write, I don't know, a thousand word essay (laughs) and then take screenshots and then put it up on Twitter. And then I would read them all and realize she was right. And I had a whole new view of the world. So by the conclusion of the second essay that you wrote for us to read, I knew I wanted to have you on the show. And actually, I literally, I had messaged you and said, please come on the show and talk about this because this is a piece of fandom I don't know about. But I think probably five minutes after I wrote that, some, one, of the, one of our other listeners <laughs> was like, can you please ask her on the show? Because this is really interesting. So yeah, I remember, I remember seeing that. Not only are you an articulate and insightful writer, you really open my mind to two parts of Young Justice fandom that I don't know that much about, which is fan fiction and shipping. I have a couple of really good friends of mine in the gaming industry, Cat Cool and, and James D'Amato, they've both been on the show, who are big fan fiction readers, right? So uh, back in a previous life, I was much more of a prose author and writing young adult fiction. And my view of fan fiction was something that was, oh, it's fun. 
it's cool. People can express themselves. But that's about all I knew. And then Kat and James started throwing out all this lingo and like these different categories and like this is what this is. And they were like, we have a lot of lingo. And they're fully into it, like really into it. Like they search out certain fan fiction authors and that kind of thing. And that was the first time I'd gotten a glimpse that this is bigger. This is a bigger piece of fandom than I knew about. So though in my head anyway, these two fandoms are closely related, they're really different. So, I mean, they can be taken in and of themselves. Someone can be a shipper without writing fan fiction, and someone can technically write fan fiction and not have it be about a romantic relationship. It could be something else, right? Yeah, definitely. Both are true. <laughs> so can you give us uh, like a quick definition of kind of what shipping means? Like, what is that defined as in fandom shipping is generally seen as just the idea of there are two characters that you watch the show you read the book you watch the movie whatever it is and there are two characters that you feel strongly should be together right romantically yes romantically and so because of that i've seen a million and one definitions of it online because everybody likes to come up with their own definition and how they see it someone sure. somewhere along the lines described it on like tumblr or something as being in love with the idea of two characters being in love which right. is the simplest way I of like doing that. it and so because of that you end up drawing fan art writing fan fiction making youtube videos amvs like what you guys share a lot of the time just yeah. any way of being like there are these two characters they need to be together and i will make that happen if the show won't and sometimes the show does and sometimes it doesn't and either way right you're just invested right. in their relationship okay i get it so take a second before we dive into fan fiction because there yes. is a ton i want to dive into <laughs> fan fiction I want to talk a little bit more, and, and then we'll kind of get back to kind of merging the two together a little bit. But there was something specific that you had mentioned about that was unique about Young Justice shipping. Please let me know if I'm using these terms incorrectly. But like, there's a, a trend in Young Justice. I don't know if it started there, but you were saying that it kind of went in a different direction as far as shipping etiquette is concerned, because there's something about the names, like a shipping, there's a shipping name for the relationship, right? And it's yes. typically a mash together. Right. Yes. My wife's name is Megan. We call her Megs and I'm rich. And so we're referred to as regs. <laughs> it's not the most amazing name, but that's the way we are. But that's what you're talking about, right? But Young yes. Justice did some things that were a little off brand. Can you talk a little bit about that? Most fandoms that develop around shows or any other type of fiction just to make it. I think part of it is just so that you don't have to type out character A and character B every single time you're talking about them. <laughs> might be it. It might right, be a time saving right. thing. You create shipping names where you take part of one character, same part of the other name, you put them together, ta-da. But with Young Justice, with a lot of the ships, it became coming up with an entirely different word that represented the ship. And part of it, I think, started... First, there was Bird Flash, of course, which was Robin and Kid Flash. People were shipping that very early on. And with that, yeah. that was still pretty close to just taking their names and putting them together. Rob Flash, people just didn't like the idea. Robin's a bird, sure. Bird Flash. Right. But then once Artemis was introduced and people started shipping her with Wally, there was a few different names going around the fandom. People were throwing around wall art and stuff, and there was just no consensus. Wall art. <laughs> yes. Wall art. They're I'm they're sorry, just a painting. People were throwing around different ones. It was like Waltimus, Artali. It was like all of these different things that just <laughs> They don't really didn't roll off the tongue. Right? Do they? <laughs> yeah. They just didn't roll off the tongue. They didn't sound right. No one was like, Yeah, that's perfect. So then after Denial, the episode with Kent Nelson happened, there's the line in that where he says, Find yourself your own little spitfire, one who won't let you get away yeah. with nothing. And people loved that line and loved that idea. So then it kind of just happened in fandom that people were like what if we call them spitfire and there was no yeah. there was no voting there was no survey of like what should we call them everybody just kind of collectively agreed they're like spitfire yeah. works let's call them spitfire i actually had to ask about that somebody god sometimes my age shows i was reading something and they were referring to spitfire and i'm like i was reading i was like is that a typo are they talking about starfire and they didn't know her name or you know what I mean? Like, I was like, wait, but they're talking. I'm like, who is this character? And they were like, you know nothing about Young Justice. What's your problem? <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, sorry, man. I had no idea what was going on here. Oh, I get it now. Okay. All right. Sorry. I'm all caught up. Carry on. Yeah. Once that happened and people had kind of just agreed together of like, we'll call them Spitfire. That opened the gate for like everything else after that. 
every ship after that yeah. had that option. Like when Zatanna right. showed up and people started shipping Robin and Zatanna, at first it w- there were a few names going around and it was like some people were calling it Rob Tana because that worked. It fit together well enough. But enough. then people were like, let's just call it Shallant. She made up that word. That's a thing that he does. Let's call it Shallant. Oh. Um See, that's so good to me. Yeah. Because it, it not just tells you who is involved in the relationship, it tells you about the relationship. Yeah, definitely. Right? With that, just it gave, it was choosing names based on significance. Yeah. Rob Tana doesn't give me a warm fuzzy. Shallant gives me a warm fuzzy in my, my chest. I like that. And the thing with Rob Tana and the thing with superhero names in general is because like so many superheroes share names, like there's Batman, Batgirl. And all of and Batwoman, they all have Bat. You can't just name every ship that has one of them in it Bat, because then it's like, wait, which one are Bat, we Bat? talking about? And because there right. are multiple Robins, it was the idea of like, if we call it Rob Tana and there's another Robin later, that'll be right. really weird to keep track of. So right. by calling it Shallant, there was no worry of being like, yeah, I ship Rob Tana. You mean Tim and Zatanna? No, no, not them. <laughs> Nightwing and Zatanna. Right. And so by calling it Shallant, it was like these two characters and it's something significant right. to both of them and it really helped clarify that but you do have some exceptions there right because there's wonder bird right isn't that tim yes. and cassie tim and cassie yeah. got called wonder bird super martian was Superboy and miss martian and they just that fit together it was fine i'm trying to remember some other ones blue pulse was blue beetle and impulse i was gonna ask about that one yeah yeah with the shipping names the one that i always thought was the most clever because there were a lot of clever ones as the show went on and even for ships i didn't ship i could appreciate how clever they were like people who shipped artemis and zatanna because that was a thing for a while because they were such close friends yeah, their yeah. shipping name was the word lesbian spelled backwards which was kind of funny and just kind of clever because zatanna says things backwards and so that became a thing with her but oh wow that <laughs> took me a minute that's actually super clever and they did that for a lot of Zatanna's ships with other people who weren't Nightwing. Some people liked the idea of like Billy Batson having a crush on Zatanna once she joined the League. And so people referred to that as the word Shazam backwards and things like that. But <laughs> the one I always thought was the most clever in season two, there's the whole thing with Connor and Wendy and with like that idea oh, of like, yeah. maybe them getting together. And right. with them, their ship name, even though I didn't ship it because I love Super Martian, I never shipped it, but... The name people came up with them. I like was... how you're defensive about it. Like you're like, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's I what just fandom make does clear, to you. <laughs> make it clear that this is not something I support. <laughs> okay. But their their ship name was Neverland because she was Wendy and he was the boy who could never grow up. And I always thought that was so clever. I was like, oh my I'm like, I don't God. ship it. Yeah. But I love that you guys came up with that. I love that. Yeah. Because this oh, became so a thing. Clever. It was like, I was like, that See, is. That is so clever yeah see that it seems ridiculous but that actually draws me to the concept of shipping more than just the the mismashing of names like wonder birds cute that kind of thing but the idea of that stimulates my imagination to think about from a storyline standpoint if i was going to write a fan fiction about connor and wendy that name gives me a through line of what kind of story i might be able to tell with them definitely right? and reflects that and same thing with Robin and Zatanna. So we, I mean, we get to see them interact a lot in the show. But the idea of Shallant being the through line of their relationship grounds it a little bit. Yes. Which I really like. Because those, all of those significance names show that like, show a lot of what the relationship is. Like Robin and Zatanna share a word. They share something that they can both think intellectually about. Artemis and Wally are always challenging each other and challenging each other to be better. So they're spitfire because they're both so passionate about everything. And those right, kinds right. of ideas are really reflected in what the Young Justice fandom did. And I always think it's cool. It sounded like you used another kind of jargon term. What did you What did you call this type of naming? Significance naming? Uh, sorry, which, which type of naming? The mashing up of names or what No, else? the uh, Chalant versus Rob Tana. Chalant, it sounded like you said significance naming. Is that what you said? Is that the term that's used or... That's a term I just made up right now. Let's, let's okay, call so, it Okay, so so everyone, <laughs> that no. that is the name of the term. We're going to define that now. I feel like that's kind of how it happened. Like it was picking something significant. 
Like there were things like yeah. Lagan and McGann. You can't fit their names together because they have such similar names. So they were called Angelfish because that's what he calls her. Of course. So that was just like, oh, Angelfish. Yeah, that's Lagan and McGann. Sure. So yeah. by picking something that was significant, it reflected just the ships and it was able for fans to more easily just be like, that's how we identify them. We identify them by the thing that matters to them as a ship. I love it. Okay, so is it okay that we'll move on to fan fiction yeah, a little bit? Sorry, and do kind of the same thing because <laughs> there was going on a tangent. Oh, you there. don't you don't need to apologize for being <laughs> into the thing you're talking about. So with fan fiction, it was interesting to me again because as a writer, you, I felt like, oh, well, I know what that is. But then we were again having a conversation, and you were—I th- don't even know what the sentence was—but you threw out a sentence describing a thing, and I was like, I have no idea what you're describing right now. And it was you talking about, I think it was disordered. Maybe you were having a conversation about disordered. I think I sent out a tweet that was just like, I can talk about disordered as hurt, comfort, fix it, fic all day. And you were like, what, what does that mean? I was like, you're speaking a different language now. And then you sent me all this stuff. So let's talk about that a little bit. So there was hurt slash comfort fic. There was fix it fic. And there's implied slash background pairing i'm sure there's probably 50 of these things can you give us a little bit of a a little bit of an insight into the different kinds yeah with fan fiction i remember a while back i read something that i think described it really well whereas in popular fiction and fiction that is out there in the world it's defined the genres are defined by what something is it's fantasy it's sci-fi it's mystery it's whatever but in fandom because you're all writing about the same characters Every Young Justice story is going to be a superhero story. There's no way to get around that. So we don't define it by that. It's genres are more defined by what things make you feel is how some people have described it. Say that one more time. Sorry. With fan fiction, a lot of the time people describe the genres as being more defined less by what a story is and more about how it makes you feel sometimes is how people have defined it where the main genres of fan fiction, which were two that I did not list in that message to you, are generally fluff and angst are the two biggest genres, where fluff fic is things that are very happy and sweet and everyone is in the right relationship and everyone is happily going about their business and just loving all the right people and it's just cute stories that make you feel all fluffy inside. Uh, Whereas angst stories deal more with... (laughs) the sad emotions. They deal with characters going through breakups. They deal with characters mourning other characters. They are the tragedies of fan fiction. Right. Whereas fluff is sometimes more comedy, sometimes just romantic. And angst fic can be romantic too. It's just that they deal more with characters being upset than characters being happy and characters going through situations that are much more upsetting for them than fluff fiction angst is when you need a good cry and fluff is when you just want to read about your favorite characters going on little adventures nice so with that just wanted to establish that because like almost everything in fan fiction falls somewhere between those two genres like sort of a spectrum you can kind of see it as like depending on where it falls but when i was talking to you on twitter about this and about that episode about disordered i described it as hurt comfort fix it fic where hurt comfort hurt fic, comfort fix it fic okay tongue twister fix it i'm fic, in fix it I'm fic. In. hurt comfort fic deals with characters going through some sort of distress whether it's physical or emotional and then being comforted by another character and so sometimes this is a way to explore romantic pairings like i'm just going to give a random example like you could write like wally breaks his arm and artemis is there in the hospital with him to help him with okay. it and so that would count as hurt comfort fic or something like after disordered because we're talking about that a lot of people were writing stories about because of that episode and all of the emotional trauma that everyone went through of seeing all of their friends die people were writing these stories of the characters kind of just comforting each other being like it's okay i i was really upset when you died just characters holding each other and telling each other it was okay because And the reason so much of it was getting written then was we talked about people thought the show wasn't going to address it. Of course, they did in Disordered. Yeah, because normal shows or your most common shows wouldn't have addressed it. They would have reset everything to zero uh, and then just moved on. Yeah, which is why Fix It Fic exists, which is just the idea of trying to fix something that happens in canon. And sometimes that means completely ignoring something that happens in the show, like 
trying to just write like after Miss Martian and Superboy broke up, for example, people were writing stories that were just like, what if that just didn't yeah, happen? Yeah, that never happened. Just no, they're still <laughs> together. It's fine because we didn't know why they broke up. There was no explanation in the first episode and into the second episode yeah. for a little while. There was no explanation of why. So people were just like, uh, no, no, that's that's wrong. The writers are wrong. So we're just going to go fix it. <laughs> and so after failsafe I kept saying after disordered i mean after failsafe for anyone who's confused after everyone right. had gone through so much emotional trauma people were convinced that the show would be like so many action shows and just pretend it didn't happen pretend everyone's fine now it's a week later it's fine so people were writing stories to try and fix what they were assuming would happen they right. were just trying to go through and be like well artemis died and wally was really freaked out about it I'm going to write a conversation between the two of them of him trying to figure out what that yeah. means. Miss Martian was distraught about all of her friends dying. I'm going to write about Connor helping her through that and just right. all of the ways people were just trying to fix all of that emotional trauma between the characters by writing about it because that's right. what you do. <laughs> yeah. The end. Were there other definitions too? Do you think that kind of covers the basics? I'm sure that there are more. There's a million and one Brand, there's so much jargon okay. in fan fiction and in fandom in general, just because we create things and then we have to name them. Yeah, we have to. Exactly. The major one that comes to mind, the only one that I didn't mention in all of that, the major one, I'm sure when this goes up, somebody will be correcting me on Twitter and be like, you forgot all of these. But yeah, no, I get it. The last one I'll mention is um, AU fan fiction, which is big in a lot of fandoms and was pretty big in Young Justice too, where it's the idea of... It's, it stands for alternate universe. Gonna clear that up. AU is alternate universe. And it's the idea okay. of taking the characters and putting them in a situation that they would never face on the show. Because it's the idea of like, there were a lot of no powers AUs with Young Justice of the idea of instead of them being yeah. a superhero team, what if they were all just normal high schoolers who went to high school together and they all still have the same personalities and the same yeah. basic backstories minus superpowers minus they live in a world where there aren't superpowers but they all still run into each other how does that change who they are oh that's fascinating yeah or the idea of what if they all live in a medieval setting what if they all live in a fantasy mm. setting instead of a superhero setting what if it's a sci-fi right. setting what if it's a different time period what if all of young justice took place in the 1950s instead of the mid-2000s yeah what if just it's so much what if like there are what if comics out there of like what if yeah. superman was evil people do the same thing with fan fiction what if artemis was a villain became a lot for a lot of things of like what if artemis followed in her family's footsteps and became a villain alongside cheshire and everything and still ran into the team like how would right. how would that affect her and their relationships and everything that particular kind of fiction is really appeals to me that idea of these alternate and it plays into the idea that I brought up on the show a few times which is the idea of how malleable these characters are in comics in general that comics are modern mythology Definitely. and that you can do so much with them and it's so interesting to me to see that people are doing these things. There was a great art series out. I'll see if I can find the link and throw it up on Twitter and Facebook. But it was a alt take on Star Wars. Like what if all the Star Wars characters were really in like an 80s high school TV show kind of a yes, thing? Yes, yes. Those get done a lot. Which was really like the takes on the aliens were particularly inter interesting. Like what would Jabba the Hutt or Greedo look like if they were human, you know? But they were part of like the bully gang or whatever. Yeah. I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. And it's so cool. And people do it with art too. Like I remember you guys shared a little while ago the gender bent Young Justice art. That was so cool. And I remember oh, when yeah, that was, that out was first, super people cool. loved it. Because that also raises so many questions about a lot of the characters of like if like if you make Miss Martian a boy, how does that affect her personality? Mm -hmm. Because so much of her personality early on is built on what it means to be traditionally feminine she's baking right. cookies and everything so it brought up right. questions it's like if miss martian's boy is he she still on the cheer squad or is she, do they right. try out for football and so yeah. those kind of questions were always super fun to address in fan fiction and in fan art and in everything that fans were doing yeah and you were talking about too the way in which this gives fans fan fiction in particular but i think shipping too gives fans some power over the narratives that they consume and can build a stronger community of fans the whole thing about geekdom for me particularly growing up 
in the pre-internet age was when you ran into somebody who liked a thing you liked and you could reference things to each other and they get it. It's like, okay, we met 30 seconds ago, but the fact that you could reference, you know, the death of a character in the Alien Legion comic or you could reference certain scenes in the ElfQuest comic or whatever. These were things that were super small, you know, very niche things, but then suddenly you have this shared experience as if you'd been old friends for a really, really long time. And I think that if you run into somebody else who ships a couple that's maybe unusual and you run into somebody who does that as well, then you you have some kind of grounding almost like to you want to know more about that person and build as a person and build a stronger connection between them. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And because of the internet, because of fan fiction being so much on the internet, you don't even just have to run into somebody randomly out in the world. You can just be online and you share your like, this is how I feel about couple X. And somebody will be like, I feel the same way. And then you can create friendships that start based on that. Yeah. And then you learn about each other and you become friends through that. And so with that, like, and it also goes the other way, because like me and my friends don't always ship the same things, but we're still mm -hmm. friends like with <laughs> right, Young sure. Justice. Super Martian is my favorite and I have other ships, of course, on the show, but Super Martian was always my OTP. I'm sorry, your OTP? Oh, the jargon. OTP, the letters in that order, stand for one true pairing, which <laughs> depending on who you ask and okay. what you're talking about is either for me, I generally define it as like my favorite couple on a particular show because there okay. are some people who define it as like, this is your favorite ship of anything you have ever read or watched ever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I consume too much media to do that. Yeah, yeah. So my Young Justice OTP is Super Martian. But then I'm like, I also ship Spitfire and Chalant and Cheshroy and a bunch of other things. But uh -huh. they were my favorite. Whereas I have one of my closest friends, Spitfire was her favorite. And that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. we're not friends and i'm not like well right you're right, wrong right well you're wrong they're not the best like that wouldn't make any sense <laughs> to me there are people who do that there are people who get into there ship always wars. are you get yes, into ship wars course. is what they call it online of you argue with people and sometimes it's about ships that share a person like some people would fight over bird flash versus spitfire because it's like they can't both date Wally, so one of us has to be right. <laughs> and so they'd argue about that. Whereas, and then sometimes it was things like fighting over Spitfire and Super Martian of being like, well, one of them has to be the best canon ship on the show. So we have to argue. And I'm like, can't we just all be friends? <laughs> can't we all just coexist? I have to say that that's probably, of course, the things like that are the ones that get the most kind of, I guess, negative press. I don't know what to call it press, but like, those are the things that you see like, man, do we really need to debate about that kind of thing? Yeah. Like, I would never tell someone not to be passionate about their thing, yeah. whatever their thing happens to be. But being passionate about your thing doesn't mean that you have to put down other people's thing. Totally. Right? The fact that you want to be able to have your own passion about your thing, you think it means that you'd respect the fact that other people want to be passionate about their thing too but that's not the way that it works out unfortunately so it's a bit of the downside of fandom the philosophy that most people try to go by is ship and let ship if i'm allowed to like what i like you're allowed to like what you like it's what most yes. people should go by some people don't right but i always try to go with that because it's not fun to argue with strangers on the internet over who's allowed to date who over <laughs> anything true yeah so so let's dive into some of these specific relationships you've been referencing so i was gonna say could we go back to what your original question was because we went oh. off there for a minute because what was my original how question it gives how it gives fans more control over the narrative and oh, that, yeah, that yeah. building yeah, up yeah. a community sorry we got so sidetracked because i yeah. just talk you don't have to say sorry to me it's maybe sorry to the listeners but i have a feeling they're still here so i hope i hope they are Go for it. With the idea of it giving more power to viewers or readers of any sort of narrative, it allows them to explore what they feel is important. You've talked about superheroes being mythology for a modern age and folk tales for a modern age. And way back in the old days, people controlled the folk tales. You told stories and other people shared them and they went on and they changed depending on who was telling them and what they cared about in the story. And so yeah. with more modern media, we generally don't get to do that. Directors and writers and actors go out, they make a thing, and they're like, 
here's the thing. This is the story. You can't change it. If you change it, then it's wrong. So fan fiction and fan art and everything people do allows them to have more control. They're like, well, I see that you've said that this is what the show is about. I don't feel like that's what the show is about. To me, the show is about this or that. Like With a lot of shows that are like very action-based, some people will be like, okay, that's cool, but I want to dive into this character's emotions and you haven't done it, so I'll just write my own story. And that gives fans the ability to be like, you don't just have to accept the media you're given. You can interact with it. You can change it. You can reshape it. You can cut off what you don't like and add what you do and send it out into the world. And there will be at least one other person who's like, I feel the exact same way. Yep, I get it. Yeah. Exactly. And that way of creating new narratives out of old narratives and mashing them together and reshaping them creates this really strong community of people who are all consuming the same media, going and making new media, and then consuming that as well and talking about that. So you could have these situations where someone could watch the show and go, I really like Spitfire, and I'm going to make a playlist of songs that remind me of Spitfire, and I'm going to put that online. Just here's a list of songs that just for whatever reason, the lyrics remind me of them, and someone could listen to that and pick one of their favorites and just be like, I really like this song. I really like this one line in this song. I'm going to go write a fan fiction based on that one line. And then that fan fiction, somebody reads it and is like, that's really cool. I love this scene. I'm going to draw that scene. And so someone yeah. sees that and is like, that's really cool fan art. And that was a good fic, but I'm going to write a different fic inspired by that fan art. And yeah. then someone else entirely could pick a completely different song off that same list and be like, I'm going to make an AMV. I'm going to just make something else entirely out of this. And that way that all of these things interact, how you will get fan art not only of Young Justice, but of specific fan fictions from Young Justice shows how this community is just making things out of other things and then making more things out of those. It just never ends. People are just creating all of this amazing stuff in this super connected community. And it's just so cool to see that. Guys, I so love living in the future. It (laughs) makes me so happy. For many of you, it's not the future, it's the present. But for me, I'm living in the future, which is brilliant and allows me to do something like this, which is create a podcast where I get to talk about my passions, whatever my passions happen to be, and hopefully inspire other people to do the same. Initiate part two. You can't see it because you're family, but I look at her and I think, that chick gets me. And really, that's all you need. Someone who sees the psycho that you are and likes you anyway. So let's dive into these relationships, right? You're talking about Super Martian, Spitfire. You brought those up. Yes. You've actually answered some of my questions about these as well, which is like, you already mentioned there's fan fictions about Super Martian. Yes. Fan fictions about Spitfire, different aspects of those relationships, right? Yes. And the Robin Zatanna Chalant relationship at least was nodded to on the show, right? Yeah. So we've talked about those a little bit, but like Wonderbird, like neither Cassie nor Tim got a lot of airtime in season two. We don't know a lot about the things that are unique about this Tim. We've talked a lot about how this Dick Grayson kind of took a lot of the unique aspects of what Tim was in the comics and incorporated them into his character. So I'm interested to see like, so for Wonderbird specifically, do yeah. people take things from the comics and kind of like their personalities and ideas from the comics and interpret them? It depends, because the thing with Wonderbird is because it was so much at the very end of the season and the very end of the series at that point, we barely saw them interact. We barely saw either of them. Wonderbird wasn't that popular because for a lot of these ships, you need something to base it on. Like, if Wally and Artemis had never interacted, I don't think people would be shipping them. So because Mm. you never see Cassie and Tim interacting and you never see what their dynamic really is, you don't have much to go on. So like in a separate tab on my computer right now, I have a thing open that has, I have a fan fiction website open with kind of the rankings of how many fics exist for each ship. Oh, okay. And so with that, like Cassie and Tim don't even show up on this list. Oh, Because there's there's so little for them in the show. So that means there's so little for people to go on. 
you watch it and you're, it's literally one line from Miss Martian of being like, yeah, Cassie kissed him because it was kind of like, eh, life is short. It's like, well, how do they interact? Okay. How would you write them interacting? And that kind of leads right. to people being like, I don't know how to write this if I don't have anything to base it on sometimes. And that's not always true. Like there are characters people ship from completely different shows even of like who have never interacted and have no ability to interact but because you know about them individually you can make up a dynamic but because Cassie and Tim both individually got so little right you have an idea of their personalities yeah but because Cassie and Tim got so little time individually and then even less time together yeah. most people weren't sure how to put them together so it ended up they're not that popular in the fandom right it's interesting because there's definitely a part of me that thinks that that's counterintuitive because like we get a lot of Superboy and Miss Martian in yeah. the show. So yes, it gives you more of their personalities and what you can do with them. But also, we've seen a lot of their actual relationship. Yes. Right? As opposed to like Dick and Zatanna, you have enough of their personality to do something with but we don't actually see any of their relationship. Yes. Right? So maybe it gives it a little bit more of a blank slate to work with. There's that right? balance that you have to strike because Superboy and Miss Martian, for example, have so much screen time together. They get together first. They're the couple that gets together first. They're together for most of the show for the first season. Right. But they're not the most popular ship. Despite having a ton of screen time, they weren't the most popular. And that also depends on how people feel about characters, because like there was some backlash against Miss Martian at first. So people were like, if I don't like her as a character, I don't care who she ends up with. So some people didn't ship her yeah. with anyone right. because of that. So you have to have that balance in a lot of media, because if you show all of a character's relationship with someone else, then people are like, well, there's the story. I don't have to add on to it. But if you show right, none right. of the relationship, then people are like what do I do with that? But like Dick and Zatanna, for example, have a very strong dynamic kind of established, even though we don't see much of their relationship. So they have this sort of flirting, they have this sort of kind of just having fun with each other. And so when there right. was that five-year time skip and they're not together anymore, it's kind of implied that they're not exactly together, but there's like the line Dick Grayson has where he says, we have a history. People are like, well, yeah, okay, what's that history? Let's explore that. You're like, we know that they were together and they know that they had something. And in response to that line, Greg Wiseman even said on Ask Greg on his website when people asked about that line and what exactly their history was, he just said, she trusts him. That was all he gave on that. So people were like, <laughs> okay, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Let's go into that. And so with five years right. of being like, they were together for some part of that. And so, yeah. so many people have different yeah. ideas on that, which is also interesting of seeing how based on one line and one kiss, people can write so many different versions of five years of they were together for like a month and then they broke up, but they were still friends. They've been on and off again for five years. Right. They broke up after a year and now they're just kind of like, eh, sometimes we go out, we have a fun time, but we're not together. We're not exclusive or anything. And you can write all of those dynamics and right. nothing in the show tells you you're wrong. There is nothing in the right. show that can prove that you're wrong either way on that. So that can be really interesting. So that takes me to something else that I want to discuss because this has come up quite a bit online and with listeners to our show, which was this view of Dick's relationships in the past. And it's interesting for me because I've seen these relationships in the comics that Dick's had. He's had several, but the ones that I've seen him in, you know, have lasted for years. Yeah. So he was with Starfire in the Titans for years. You know, he and Barbara have been together. The Zatanna thing is never, it, it gets explored in the animated series quite a bit and that kind of thing with her and Bruce in Batman the Animated Series and her and Dick in Teen Titans. But it's not really a thing that happened in the comics, which I find interesting. But when you see these relationships over 40 years of me reading the comics, he doesn't seem like a player. He's just been in some long-term relationships. But because of the weirdness of how comics work, the 40 years that I've seen him, those 40 years were basically compressed into four years or something like five years now, yeah. right? Because if he was in, say, 1918 or 19 when he became Nightwing in 1984, right? So this was in 1984 when he became Nightwing. And so now it's 
30 plus five years later, right, that he's been Nightwing. But in the comics, he's been Nightwing for just a few years. Yeah. So all the relationships he's had while he's been in Night- Nightwing over 40 years are basically compressed over four. Does that make sense? Yes. Definitely. So it makes him look like he's this really kind of creepy player. And Wally's comment about him being a dog doesn't really help. That's not really like the Dick Grayson that I see. Yeah. The Dick Grayson that I see is someone who people follow because they want to follow him, right? They follow him because they trust him, they care about him, and they know that he cares about them and loves them. And I see him carry that into his relationships in my head canon. Yeah. Which is just because you're not with a single person for the rest of your life doesn't mean that you don't truly love and care about the people that you might be with. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So how does the fan fiction and or shipping view these series of Dick's relationships? Do you have any insight into that? It depends, of course, because it always depends on who is shipping, who is writing. But in general, from what I've seen, and of course, my experience in fandom is always going to be just mine. It's always unique for everyone. Like who I interacted with is different from someone else's. But what I generally saw was if people shipped Shallant in season one and still liked the idea of them being together in season two, they wrote that and they just went with that. They're like, there's nothing technically in the show that really says how many people he has been with or how long he was with anyone or how those relationships yeah. ended. The comic they, they imply some things in the comics. They though. do. Like his list of exes in the comics includes Rocket, who we never saw him interact yeah. with in the show, but that's right. thrown in there just as like, I'm one of your exes too. And I'm like, okay, uh, sure. And his relationship with Batgirl is never really established beyond they might have one. The comics are just kind of like she shows up at his apartment on his birthday and is like, let's talk and then it ends and it's like okay then you can take that a few ways depending on what you ship and how you want to interpret their relationships yeah i guess i wanted to see if people interpret him negatively as a character no no okay nightwing is one of the fan favorites in the show if you ask anybody like do you like nightwing from young justice it's like yes of course because he's clever and he's charming and he's all of these things that just people are drawn to for his character and so when it came to all of his relationships instead of people being like wow you just date a bunch of girls and break up with them people were like you've dated a bunch of girls and most of the female members of the fandom would probably want to date you too so we're okay with that (laughs) yeah yeah interesting okay I feel like, at least for me, when I was watching the show, it never Mm -hmm. really bothered me. I never was watching the show and I'm like, "Mm, I am not really comfortable with how many people Nightwing's dated, especially because during that five years, most of that, he's a teenager. We don't know how serious any of these exes were. Like, it could have been like, for a week when he was 15, he dated Rocket and they both were like, Mm, no. And the show never really tells us anything beyond that. So I never watched it and didn't like Nightwing. Whenever I didn't like Nightwing or didn't agree with what Nightwing was doing, it was never because of his relationships. It was because he was keeping secrets from the team and endangering people's lives. I was like, "Um, (laughs) maybe you should just tell your friends what you're doing, (laughs) not maybe you shouldn't date so many people. That's fair. Thank you. That clarifies it for me. I'm very defensive of Dick Grayson. I... (laughs) As people may know, I just want to make sure that he's not being misinterpreted. I understand. I am very defensive of Miss Martian <laughs> from people early on. We're like, she's a Mary Sue and she's all of this stuff. And I'm like, no, she's not. Let me tell you why you're wrong. Yeah. And actually, you brought that up with me, too, um, because I had mentioned uh, several times on the show that <laughs> I, I was just so annoyed. It started with Starfire, actually, in the Teen Titans yeah. show, because Starfire, Wonder Woman, Black Canary, these characters mean something to me. And they, I, I have a daughter now who's three, three and a half. And of course, they mean something to me now because of her, but they've meant something to me my whole life. Like, I've always wanted to see more of these strong female characters. I I get the rationalization that I guess people have about how Starfire was interpreted in Titans, but it annoyed the heck out of me. Because when she's an adult, she is a brilliant, charismatic tactician and leader of people. 
And she was just kind of this ditzy airhead and it drove me nuts. I get that she evolves and changes and this is who she was when she was younger. I get all those, I've heard all those arguments before, but that's not what we're seeing on the screen. And when I saw Miss Martian, the first scenes we get her in is this stuff, this kind of 70s, 80s, ditzy teen stereotype. Now, of course, we now know that's exactly what they wanted us to feel like, but it put me off. And I don't think for an unreasonable reason, but I, when I brought it up, you brought up a whole bunch of stuff. You wrote one of your essays. Yeah. Just about how being feminine should not be considered negative. And yeah. I don't think I looked at it as it being a negative trait. I felt like it was the writer's taking the cheap, easy, overly used route instead of trying to put some depth and a twist on something, you know? Yeah. For me, I always loved Miss Martian from the beginning. She was my favorite character. I've talked about it online a bit. A bit. <laughs> Maybe a little. It might be part of my Twitter bio. Who knows? <laughs> But I always really liked that she was allowed to be soft because there is this tendency a lot in comics of like, we are creating yeah. a strong female character. That means she doesn't have emotions and doesn't care about girl stuff. And I'm like, right. I, I loved that Miss Martian was able to care about things and allowed to be excited about things. And like, there's some interview yeah. I remember where Danica McKellar, who voices Miss Martian, was talking about why she loves her character and was talking about how she is both incredibly powerful and can do all of the things that all of her male teammates can do and can fight as well as any of them but superboy can walk into the room and she just gets really flustered and i always thought that was right. <laughs> adorable and so fun for a character because right i was a teenage girl when the show was going on i felt like i could write well and do other things well but there were other situations in which i did not feel confident so like the idea that miss martian's confidence is she can be in battle and destroy a plane with her mind but her yeah. love interest is like i'll carry your books and she's like oh my god you will oh my god that's so nice I, just, uh, I loved that right and i loved that she was able to do all of these things and at the same time to be feminine without being sexualized i never felt like miss martian as a character was sexualized which seems to be like when you're creating for a lot of these shows and a lot of comics yeah. it's like if we're making her girly and powerful then we're making her sexualized and powerful and i'm like i no, that's that's not the same thing. <laughs> so yeah. I always no, liked Miss Martian, but I will end my rant because I could go on forever about how much I love Miss Martian as a character <laughs> and why all of the reasons. Well, we'll have dueling rants. I will once again put out there that I had to retract everything that I had said <laughs> once we got to Image. You know, yes. once I saw Image, the first time I went through the show and was watching it, I was like, I assumed this show was being written like other shows, which was episodic piece by piece with a little bit of a through line. And that's pretty much it. So when we got to that reveal, I was like, oh, OK, they heard people complaining about <laughs> how she's terrible and they just fit in this origin that's cute right because i didn't get it the first time i was watching it i enjoyed it and liked it but of course it's not until you watch it a second or third or fourth yeah. time when you start seeing things like <laughs> coming up on comedy network <laughs> another episode of hello you know in the background and then somebody turns the tv off yeah. or whatever and you're like oh <gasps> oh my God, there's all this stuff happening. And then I had no idea. And now I have to eat all of my feet in my mouth for all of the terrible things I said and start a podcast and spend it all apologizing. I'll admit that I, I can't remember exactly because it was five years ago when the show was on that I might have found out the reveal before it happened on the show because I am one of those people who when they like a thing, they try to go and find out all of the things about the thing. So like I went to my local library, got books on DC see comics and got like famous storylines and I would go to Wikipedia and like look up my favorite characters and be like what do I need to know about this character to fully understand the show because there is so much history yeah. on the show I was like I want to get all the in jokes even though I don't have the years and years of comics right. knowledge that other people do so on her Wikipedia page one of the first things it says is Miss Martian is a white Martian from Mars in DC Comics and I'm like she she's what she's what now and then <laughs> she and fans because of the internet because of everything fans who had read the comics or knew her storylines in the comics also knew that and were talking about that because she was part of the titans for a while and like the idea of her yeah. being a white martian and possibly being a traitor was something that happened in 
Teen Titans. And so that was brought on to Young Justice. Yeah. And so fans talking about that online and rewatching episodes a million times on the Cartoon Network website, people like caught the screenshot of her as a white Martian in Bereft. And people were like, yeah, what is this? And so people were theorizing about that and the shot of her in the cheerleading uniform and people oh. were trying to put everything together even back then. I'm so glad I didn't get involved in that, yes. though, because that reveal was amazing. I still loved so. the reveal, even though I technically knew it was coming. I didn't know when it was coming or how it was going to happen, but I was aware for a lot of that. So that might have influenced why I loved her so much, but I right. still like her personality. I never felt like it was a complete mask because I feel like a lot of people my age, because of what we what we watch and everything we absorb some of that into who we are like i love i love comics now and i didn't when i was younger so i'm a different person now than i was then and what i care about and everything it right. just so happens that the thing she cared about as much as we care about things was a 70s sitcom so instead of wearing <laughs> right. a superhero shirt she's like i am going to make myself look like my favorite character and i'm going to be the oh, best no. cosplayer in the world <laughs> oh god exactly we talk about that in uh, i think the linguistics episode yeah. So yes, too, yes, that was we were talking so cool. with Quinn Wilson. Yeah, Quinn's amazing. All right, so let's move on to some other things too here, because I I'm already know this is probably going to be a two-parter. <laughs> so many tangents. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. No one gets to come on the show and apologize for their geekdom. All right, but I do want to talk about some other things. So there are relationships that fans have basically in their own head canon, which you yes. nodded to a little bit before, that either didn't exist on the show at all or at least don't explicitly exist on the show. Like you mentioned Bird Flash, right? Yes. So the the Dick Grayson, Robin, and Kid Flash, because of their close friendship, Yes. right? Some people ship them. Or the Impulse Beetle one, which, what did you call it? Since I was never big into the ship, I'm trying to remember. It was, oh, it was Blue Pulse and Speed Buggy, I believe, were the two ones that were floating around that people went back and They forth. were Speed what? Speed Buggy, I believe, was the speed other one. Speed Buggy. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> okay, that's hilarious. Because Blue Pulse was fine, but people wanted worship names. No, Speed Buggy people is Speed buggy is my names. favorite. All right, so for me, I would think that these combinations, you know, whether you're whether you're up for them or not, like whether you're into a particular ship or not, I think that these combinations for me seem like an interesting insight into the fans who love that particular relationship, right? So there's some combination of personality traits that, of course, make these characters close friends on the show. But if that they were developed into a romantic relationship, would really make an interesting life team dynamic, right? Like my wife and I are very different. I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. She's very practical. I'm quite the dreamer, right? And those differences can be challenging sometimes, but they also make us a better team, right? I could literally not be doing what I'm doing right now for the show if her practicality hadn't have grounded me in getting focused on a job that pays the bills well and that kind of thing. And, you know, that and the inspiration my kids give me on a daily basis, right? So do you think that the relationships that these fans are that fans are drawn to in general reflects kind of the kind of relationships that they themselves would like to have? Like, I, I've already said I connect with Dick Grayson and how, you know, I, I didn't meet my wife till I was in my 30s. So I had relation, a lot of relationships before that that clearly didn't work out. But I'm, I mean, I'm friends with almost all of them. Like any of them, any of my exes, if they came to me for help, I'd be happy to be there to support them. It doesn't mean that I don't care about them. It's just that we didn't make a good relationship couple, right? So that's how I relate to Dick. So do you think that the fans are drawn to the, like, maybe they have a, they relate to say Jaime. Or they relate to Megan, or they relate to Artemis, and they want to have someone like Bart or Connor or Wally in their life. Or am I just reading like way too much into this? You know, this is relatively new to me, so I don't know. But that's my assumptions. <laughs> that gets brought up a lot in fandom sometimes, like when people talk about things. Because sometimes, like, because there'll be stuff that gets brought up where it'll be somebody will say something like, "I ship Harley Quinn and Joker," and people are like, "Well, that's super unhealthy." Would you be comfortable with that in, in real life? Or would you, whatever yeah. it is. And so I feel like sometimes there has to be that separation between fiction and reality. Like there are yeah, things yeah, you'd yeah. accept in a comic book, in a TV show that you would not accept with people in your real life. No one is really yeah. wants to date the Joker, even if they think right. the dynamic between Harley Quinn and the Joker is interesting. No, that's absolutely fair point. With Young Justice, like I ship super martian but that doesn't mean i would ever want to have a stable relationship for five years and then a very messy breakup right 
But at the same time, because Miss Martian is my favorite character, I think that does influence the fact that I'm more drawn to Super Martian as a ship. Because you have to care about the characters individually to care about them together, I think. Yeah. Superboy and Miss Martian are two of my favorite characters on the show, and I love their arcs, and I love their arc together. So with that, I can't go into all of it because I'm not a psych student. I don't know everything, but... No, no, that's fair. But I mean, you're out there and you're in the conversations a lot. And of course, you're not going to take something and like, oh, now I know everything about you because you want (laughs) to see, you know, Impulse and Blue Beetle together or whatever. But I can't help but think like the reason why you like a character on a show is either that you relate to something about that character that's in yourself or there's something about that character you would want to have in yourself, right? Those are like the two main reasons, right? When it comes to like the ships, because they all have such distinct dynamics, a lot of people will notice when they watch a lot of shows, read a lot of things and have a bunch of different ships, there will be similarities between their ships. A lot of people who ship Spitfire like that dynamic of characters who have that sort of arguing dynamic with each other until they get together because that shows up a lot in media so there's definitely a tendency to go towards ships that you're like i have shipped things like this in the past i will ship things like this in the future but it's not always necessarily exactly who you are or who you'd want to date but with things like bird flash and blue pulse and those sorts of ships that aren't technically canon in the show but are based on these really close friendships part of that i think the reason they were so popular because Looking at, I mentioned that I had a list open in another tab, Uh, the most popular ships on that site are Spitfire, followed by Bird Flash, followed by Blue Pulse, followed by Super Martian. And I think part of that is that, especially in the first few episodes, the only female character was Miss Martian. And she clearly liked Superboy, and Superboy clearly liked her. And if you don't have any other female characters... Right. There's nothing stopping you from being like, well, there's there's no reason these two boys can't be dating. And that's a lot right. on a lot of fandom. It's also that way of taking over the narrative that a lot of fans feel like they're being able to be part of a narrative because of Cartoon Network in those days and what they were allowed to show on TV because of yeah. distribution and ratings and stuff. They weren't allowed to have same sex relationships. But fans were still right. drawn to them. People were like, Well, Wally and Robin are such good friends and if they were part of the lgbt community why wouldn't they be together so people would write that and the same with blue beetle and impulse the closest thing to a romantic thing in the comics there's some reference to like blue beetle thinking cassie's cute there's one really brief reference and that's it and that's like the only thing that he has for a romantic right. anything. So when right. people are seeing them being like, they're having all of these moments and they're having all of these interactions. And I'm pretty sure I remember even seeing back in the day, even though I wasn't really into either of those ships that much, people were drawing similarities between the ways the actual romantic ships in season one acted and the way the two of them acted in season two. Like there are certain moments where they're very concerned about each other and very much wanting to support each other in battle. And people are like, that happened with Superboy and Miss Martian in this other episode. Like when you when you have those kind of parallels, you're like, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe they're supposed to, maybe we're supposed to read them like that. Maybe we're not. Either way, we're... Yeah. Fans are going to do it because it's fun. It's fun to just be like, well, what if? What if this friendship wasn't just a friendship? Or what if this character right. wasn't the sexuality that the show seems to be leaning towards saying they are? But that's how that's how imagination works. That's how creativity works. I Absolutely. mean, the whole point. I mean, Greg and Brandon and the whole team have interpreted a lot of these characters very, very differently by doing basically this same thing. Like, okay, if we have Garfield in the show... And we have Miss Martian as a main character. How can we interpret his origin to fit in this story? And what they came up with was genius, right? So, yeah, that's just the way these speculation pieces help fuel our imagination in an appropriate way, I think. So for a second, I want to pull back from the specific relationships a little bit and talk about storytelling, about shipping in general. You mentioned something that I thought was interesting. You said Young Justice never did a quote-unquote shipping episode. Yes. And I... I didn't even think about that until you kind of explained to me what that meant. And I was like, oh, yeah, that totally happens where there's kind of a relationship weirdly alluded to, but they don't really focus on it. They focus on the murder mystery of the day or the monster they're fighting of the day or whatever until they're like, okay, today's the day we're going to write this relationship episode and get this off the plate. Right. We're going to check it off, you know. 
right? Can you dive dive into that a little bit? It happens so often, especially in shows aimed at a younger audience, because you want to be like, every single week, we're just going all of this action. We're just having all of these monsters, whatever it is. But right. they want to be able to check off that box, it feels like. Like, they want to be able to like, look, we're a real well-rounded show. We have all of the genres, including romance, in this one episode, but it's there. So I always really appreciated, like, and it's one of those things you don't notice until you go back and watch the whole show as a whole. Young Justice never did that. Because yeah. a lot of shows will have, like, they'll come up with some random villain that can, like, somehow influence romantic relationships. It's happened more times than I can remember in a lot of shows <laughs> that I watch where it'll be like, this oh, villain's yeah. power is that they make people fall in love. And I'm like, Okay, it's time for the shipping episode. Let's go. Okay. But Young Justice yeah. never did that. No, I get it. And and it reflects back on the other thing that you were talking about, about the idea that since there wasn't a shipping episode, they didn't need to have a shipping yeah. episode because they folded everything into every episode. Yes. For an ensemble cast. Yes. Right? It's not just like Buffy and Angel or whatever, <laughs> right? Yes. There is, you know, scores of characters over two seasons and, and how those dynamics work. Yes, there's so many, and they all have such different dynamics, and they all get different amounts of screen time, but you still understand them, and the show never felt like it needed to sit down and be like, okay, let's talk, let's talk about Super Martian, and even when, like, to me, right. Terrors is a very, is a very Super Martian episode, because most of the cast isn't there, there's mainly only Superboy yeah. and Miss Martian, but there is still, like, addressing Superboy's issues with Superman, there's still addressing the ice villains from the first episode there's still connor being incredibly smart there's all of these other things going on and there's mm -hmm. this plot of superboy and miss martian also dealing with their romance in prison so even with stuff like that they made sure that there was never just one thing i always loved that i actually love the scene it's funny i've, I've recently seen that some people hate it for some reason but the therapy session with hugo strange yeah in terrors is fantastic it's a fantastic moment yes i love that scene that scene was so well done and i love it both because it shows connor's development and it shows that but it also shows that mcgann is aware of these things because so much of the show they never they never had her address that it's like she really cares about connor but they never show that she is super aware of what is upsetting him and what his problems are and that i remember in the first few episodes a lot of people were like Miss Martian only likes Connor because he's cute. It's like, maybe right. it started that way, but she's very aware of what problems Connor has. And they even have yeah. that line later in the episode where Ice School Junior is like, all you need is someone who sees the psycho that you are and likes you anyway. And <laughs> right, Connor right. realizes, like, she actually knows me. Yeah. And <laughs> that interaction between them where she points out that she, in a subtle way and doesn't tell him, just makes it very clear to the audience that she knows that Connor feels inferior to Superman and that Connor has been struggling with this and that she is very aware of that because the audience is totally aware of that and knows that's a problem, but it shows that she knows too. And that Connor fires back right. with not only a reference to the fact that he understands her and her optimism and understands that that can get annoying sometimes. It's also that subtle reference to him knowing about Hello, Megan and how he hasn't told her yet, but he knows and all of that together, yeah. it's such a cool, cool scene of just showing that they both know so much about each other that you don't immediately realize. I was going to call shenanigans on the fact that she only likes him because he's he's cute. Yes. I, sorry, guys. She is a shapeshifter that looks like a giant monster. <laughs> and we know that, like, and particularly in season two, Superboy says it specifically. Yes. The body is just clothing for the mind inside. Yes. So none of this thinking he's cute thing makes any sense whatsoever. Yes. It's actually almost exactly the opposite, that she could tell that there was something inside him. He was wrestling with a different version of the thing she was wrestling with. Yes. Right? Absolutely. But yeah. of course, because in the first few episodes, we didn't have the whole series to look back on. People were like, this girl who's just this green human, that's her only thing that makes her look weird is that she's green, walks in, sees the tall, cute boy in a Superboy shirt and is like, that one's mine. And that's their whole relationship, isn't it? And of course, that's not what it is. And of course, the show expands on that so much right. and shows that they complement each other in such interesting ways. And it's just great. But 
because right. I love that scene, that therapy scene, because it shows that. Right. And the parallel there, I mean, we're talking about Superboy and, and Miss Martian here, but also with Artemis and Wally. Yes. Right? There's no need to have these shipping episodes because, I mean, we see all these things that drop during a, a season, but the fact that I was watching this and I'm like, yeah, okay, they're arguing a lot and that kind of thing. And then Robin makes the comment in Bereft about get a room and like all this kind of stuff. That's really, I was like, oh, it's cute, but they're not going to do anything <laughs> with it. It's just, that's just their dynamic because no one ever does anything with it. <laughs> yes. Right. So true. And then when you go back and watch it again, you're just like, oh, like it feels inevitable now, but it only feels inevitable because we now know that what the creative team was doing, right, was aiming at. I remember when, when Infiltrator came out and they introduced Artemis. Yep. At first, when she, st- but those first few scenes where she's like arguing with Wally, I remember because... I am a shipper and a girl who watches a lot of shows like you pick up on the things that are supposed to be coded as romantic of like the things that you realize you're like, oh, that's a hint that these two people like each other. So is that. So is that with them? I was like, maybe they'll get together. Maybe they won't. Later in that episode, there's this thing where it's such a small thing, but I was like, they're they're probably going to have something with these two where Cheshire pushes kid flash off and he stumbles backwards and like falls into artemis and there's this shot of them like super close together and then they both jump back i'm like okay they're they're ending up together because these are the (laughs) things that are like you don't include stuff like that unless you're trying to show that there is something more between these characters because i'm like there's no reason for wally to fall like that they wouldn't have had him be thrown into superboy and have that same shot So I'm like, okay, that's the thing. And it's one of those things. But with their relationship, what I loved was so many shows do that thing where they're like, this is the relationship dynamic between these two characters. Any development they might have will get reset by the next episode because it has to stay episodic to keep things simple. Right. And they end up in like, I think I called it a relationship limbo in something I sent to you. Yeah. It was like the will they, won't they dynamic, but it just gets so frustrating after a while because you're like, yeah. You've done things that would mean you'd be in a relationship at this point, but they're not on a lot of other shows. Like I can think of at least one show from the same time on Cartoon Network where two characters where one character asked someone to a dance and they went together and then they never address it for the rest of the season. You guys went on a date. Yeah. You'd probably address that and then it doesn't. But with Young Justice, they make everything feel so organic. And with like Wally and Artemis, there are those moments where their dynamic shifts significantly throughout the series. There's bereft where they like establish if they had met under different circumstances, they'd probably be dating right by now. They'd probably not be fighting all the time if they'd met under different circumstances. And then failsafe shows that even under the circumstances they're under, Wally really cares about her and just won't admit it. And then insecurity resets all of that, but it makes sense that it resets all of that. It's not just a new episode. We're ignoring that. It's like, just showing yeah. that they progress over the course of the season in such an interesting way. And they don't have that like static, we fight and that means we like each other dynamic. It's like we fight and that's going to lead to us not fighting as much until one of us does something that the other one really doesn't like. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. was, I always loved that, that they let them progress and that they let all of the relationships progress like that. It's a unique dynamic, and it's a thing that Christopher Jones and I talked about, too, just the fact that this show has timestamps, and the comics have timestamps, showing that you cannot ignore that Robin is five years older and now Nightwing. Like, there is time progression, which means relationships progress for good or ill, and all of these things progress. And speaking of that, Miss Martian did terrible things to Superboy. (laughs) Yes. Like, really violating not good things between the seasons that led to what was a fascinating, to me, like, bit of storytelling in season two. But by the end of season two, they kind of wrap things up a little bit. Like, things are okay. Yes. I know that you're a, a Super Martian shipper, And I want to take this to everybody, including Wally and Artemis. I will go on record now that being a comic reader, I'm 100% convinced Wally's in the Speed Force and he'll come back at some point and that's fine. So I want to take this to other dynamics, right? So if if Wally comes back and Artemis is there, depending on when he comes back, of course, they're probably going to get back together. But with with Miss Martian and Superboy, I'm not entirely convinced I want them back together. I think they make a great couple, but I think that I would be a little bit concerned about Connor if they didn't really address this well. Yes. This thing that she did was not okay. Made for great story. Yes. But from a relationship standpoint. So how do you feel about that? What do you you want to see in season three and beyond? I will say, 
with season two, that season two premiere oh, was so hard for me as a viewer and as a shipper and just in general, me and my friends, because I had a really amazing group of friends when the show was on. We're all still friends who in real life, we all went to the same school. So we'd after every episode, we come in and we talk about it. And I remember after that one, we all came into school and we're like, what just happened? Because it was right. It was one week after the season yeah. one ended and it was like all of our ships are together and everyone's happy and everything's so cool. I can't wait for next week. I can't wait to see where they take this in season two. This is going to be so cool. And then next week we tune in. It's Saturday morning. We're like, yes, what's going to happen? What? What is going on? Everyone is Train wreck. Up. Wally and Aww. Artemis aren't even here. Aqualad's not here. Miss Martian is dating some sea creature. Her hair is shorter. <laughs> oh, what is happening? <laughs> The pixie cut was a big emotional moment <laughs> to like, I won't even lie. 14 year old me was like, they cut her hair and I'm not okay. That's so funny because Darcy Ross said the same thing. She's like, I don't know what was happening. People's hair were cut. I had, I, I didn't like any of this. And of course it wasn't cut, cut. Like she yeah. just, she can change yeah. it in a moment to moment's basis. She just chose to have it shorter. But I think it's really funny that you, you and Darcy both had the same reaction. Like, this is not okay. And I've done it with other shows. It's because you get so set and you're like, this is what this character looks like. They did it on Legend of Korra, too. They cut her hair in season four and it made sense. Oh, and yeah, it was amazing. True. And it was a great character thing. But like when that trailer got released and it's like, Korra has a bob now. I was like, what happened? <laughs> so it's just that thing That's of like, so you funny. get so used to that character. And especially because... Cutting characters' hair in fiction is generally connected to some important thing in their life. Like, Cora cuts her hair because she's changing a lot about her yeah. life. Miss Martian cuts her hair. There were theories going around because people were like, why would she cut her hair? Why would they do that? Because there's got to be a reason for everything. So a lot of it was stuff like with Marie Logan. People were thinking that she didn't want to look just mm -hmm. like the person that she'd been looking like for so many yeah. years that she was like, I can't do that anymore after her death. So she chopped it all off, had that emotional haircut. Well, also she's spending time with Garfield yeah. now and, and how is that going to hurt him? And he wouldn't want her to totally change yeah. because he relates to her like a human relates to her, but also probably walking around looking like his mom is not going to be yeah. great. So like you got to find a middle ground somewhere, you know? So with that and everything that changed in season two, that was hard for me as a viewer just because everything was so different. I was like, I remember being right. like when it was on, it was like, I'm the same age as Robin. Robin is going to be 14. He turns 15 in the comics and is 15 by the end of season one. We don't know that until the comics came out. But And then I'm like, oh, yeah. he's he's this age. He's going to be going into high school at the same time. I'm going into high school. This is going to be so cool. We're going to yeah. age with these characters. This is going to be so amazing. And then they cut and he's like, <laughs> oops. I'm like, you're 19 now. How do I even relate to you as a character? Of course, as the season went on, I loved it more and more as it went on. But those first few episodes, me and my friends talked about it as like, we felt like we were being betrayed, which we were being very yeah. overdramatic. Um, but it felt that way of just everything changed. And there was no six month gap between seasons for us to even come to terms with that idea. It was one week, everyone's in high yeah. school. And the next week, everyone's in college. Everyone's an adult. Everyone on the show can vote now. What do we do with that right interesting yeah. but with that because it was so hard and because they with shipping getting back to the topic at hand they split up Superboy yeah, yes. and Miss Martian and because we had no knowledge on that for a little while it was hard to process and it was hard to like come to terms with because not only were they split she was with someone new I will admit for all of season two and for different reasons besides just that I didn't like Lagan as a character. And I think it started with yeah. that feeling immediately because we don't know why they broke up or how they broke up. That feeling of this Atlantean dude comes in and breaks up my ship and what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> and of course, that's not what happened, but that's how it felt. Sure, yeah, yeah. So... That was hard to deal with. And as the show progressed and we understood why they broke up, I was like, that makes sense. It still hurts me emotionally, but it makes sense. <laughs> right. So with the idea of them getting back together, I think it could work. I have read fan fiction in which it does work, and I have felt that it works because after season two ended and we thought there weren't going to be any, tons of people wrote what they felt was a continuation for oh, the series. Oh, of course. Right. Wally coming back for a million and one different reasons. Like, I'm pretty sure there's a list out yeah. there somewhere that's just like all the ways Wally could come back. Use it how you right. will. And with Superboy and Miss Martian, it's generally the idea of they would have to have a conversation and they would have to take time. I don't think that if like 
season three picked up right where season two left off, which I don't think will happen. But yeah, if it did, I, d- I can't see them getting together like a week after all of this has gone down. But I feel like with the groundwork they laid throughout all of season two from us finding out why it happened and us as viewers seeing that Miss Martian really regrets it. Connor has that moment where he assumes that she regrets it just because she got caught. And I never felt like that. I never felt that she only regretted it because someone figured it out because he figured it out. I think she would have regretted it either way. I always felt like it was a very impulsive decision she made in the case of him. Like she was like, she panicked and lashed out instead of thinking like, I am going to change my boyfriend's memory. That's my plan. I'm going to think about that. So you don't think it was premeditated? I never felt It was a crime of passion moment type of a thing? I never felt that it was premeditated. If there Mm. had been something on the show that, established like miss martian was planning for weeks to wipe superboy's memory i'd be like oh yeah no that's really not okay it's already not yeah. okay i didn't her actions right. with that i never felt that oh yeah that's fine like i was never one of those people who was going to like be a miss martian apologist and be like oh yeah no that's fine but <laughs> <laughs> i understood how it could happen and understood why it happened. Sure. So moving into like a season three, do you think that they can get back together in season three and have it be okay? Like I'm assuming, (laughs) like you had just said, there's fan fiction out there in which that's happened. Is there a particular way that you've read that really clicks with you about how? Generally, it takes place over a long time. Like, I don't think it would be a few days or weeks or even months. I think they would need to get, like, by the end of the season, they're just back on speaking terms and just back to being friends. But I feel like there's so much history there between them and there is so much emotion between them that they that if they were given time to kind of settle into how they were together and how they were apart and have her not be with a rebound guy because I think that affected their relationship a ton of how they were able to heal after that because in the comics they show that they break up and within like a week it's like only a few weeks at most she's dating Lagan there is no time for her to process being alone because she just gets together with someone else if they had time to sort of get back to being friends and maybe get back to exploring their relationship together i think it could work it would definitely need to be handled carefully but i think it's one of those things where by the end of the season end of season two they've both thought about it so much and miss martian has really figured out why what she did was so wrong and why everything that she did in season two was not the best choices she could have made. I think by the end of that, there is a definite feeling that they could get back together. I'm not sure if they will. I don't know. I'm not Greg Wiseman, but I think there is a, a chance and I think there's a way that they could make it work. A lot of stuff goes by the idea of there'd have to be a lot of discussion between them, but there's also in a lot of things, there's kind of like how terrors is that moment where Superboy realizes he can't live without her because she almost dies. And he's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through life not telling her how I feel after she almost dies. A lot of people think that if something like that happened again, if there was another chance that they could have lost each other, some people think that that might have them snap back into being like, yeah, I can't. I can't go through life just pretending that we broke up and everything's fine now because that's not that's not true for us because the show implies that they were together for five years, that they were in a steady relationship for five years. And not only that, the show, they were living together for all of that because they're living together in the cave, which was always funny, but is also super emotional for them i think like yeah that's also why their breakup is so so bad they have to still live and work together right despite being angry at each other so i think there is enough history there that they could build that relationship again in a season three if they felt it made sense but awesome of course i ship them so i care (laughs) yes all right so let's move on to a couple of last wrap-up things yes where were you when you heard about season three do you remember I do. I do. I was in an audition. Uh, I was in a big group audition for the show that I am currently in for King Henry the Fourth, And so it's a ton of us there. There's just a bunch of us. We're standing on tables. We're shouting soliloquies. We're running sides. We're doing all of this. And we're like halfway through several hours of auditioning. And the director is like, everybody take a break. Everybody sit down for a little bit. So we all go to the edges of the room, start digging snacks and water out of our bags, and we all pull out our phones like the millennials we are. (laughs) And I have a text from my brother that just says, 
you should Google Young Justice season three and see what comes up. And that's all he said. <laughs> so I imme- I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And so I like open I opened my web browser and immediately Googled it. And there's like a million articles that are like, it's been confirmed. And so I like immediately opened the group chat that I have with three of my best friends who we all watched it back in the day. And we're all very much like there should be a season three. There should be a season yeah, three. Yeah. And texted them like, have you guys heard that this is happening? Nice. <laughs> and because I'd been in several hours of auditioning, I heard about this a bit late because right. their response was, yeah, we heard. We just tagged you on Facebook about this go yes, look where have you been and i'm like i'm sorry i don't have all of these notifications so i went and we were just so excited so i had that moment in an audition where everybody's just like reading over their lines and getting a drink of water and whatever and i'm like internally screaming because right. i'm like this show has been <laughs> off the air for years and it's coming back and i have no one to yell at about it <laughs> That's oh my awesome. god nice but it was so it was so fun. It was so great. I was just so excited for the rest of the night. I was like, this is amazing. It happened. I can't believe it. No, it was mind blowing. <laughs> awesome. Anything else that you want to add to our brief conversation here? I'm trying to think, was there anything that we missed that I wanted to touch on? The one thing I will say with the season three and with the five year time skip and with everything that we missed and all of that with those five years, on one hand, it led to a bunch of amazing work by fans. Yeah. As much as the time skip frustrated me at the time, it led to fans going, oh, if we're missing five years, let's let's just write those five years. What happened in those five years? If we don't have any info, we're just going to write it. Like people yeah, like Cheshire and Roy how they got married and had a kid and people are like you had one kiss and some fighting while you were flirting how did we get here and the video game does a little bit with that with his like journals but people would just write really long fan fictions being like this is how i imagine their relationship going right right and like wally misses valentine's day four years in a row people are like well that's a story i need to write (laughs) because how does that happen (laughs) four years in a row and with that other things the one thing I remember when season two happened and we got that time skip coming into school the next day and sitting down with my friends at lunch to happily talk about Young Justice. But that day it was like very somber, like everything's different. I remember looking at my friends and I said something where I was like, we're never going to get a prom episode. And that oh. was the moment they're like, oh my God, you're <laughs> right. That's what we missed in five years. Like that was the <laughs> thing that was, I was like, it was on a list of other things. Like we missed wow. graduation. We missed all these holidays. But I was like, we're never going to get a prom episode because everyone's an adult now. Wow, so that funny. led that apparently me and my friends aren't the only ones who felt like that because people <laughs> have written many stories that are like team goes to prom because we never got to see that. That's Again, funny. excited about dress shopping. Artemis thinks all of this is silly, but the team is going to prom. Nice. And so I always thought that was fun, connecting all the things here. So uh, you and I have already chatted about you doing some research for us and putting together a list of some fan fiction that, of course, fan fiction is going to be all subjective, but things that, yes, that you think that course. some people might want to read. And we're going to put that up in our Whelmed article archive that we have for our Patreon backers. Yes and make that available with links so that people can go and check out at least some examples. And then that at least gives them a toehold to be able to go in and explore. Yes, I've been going back through a ton of archives. And of course, one of the problems is trying to find things that are appropriate for all ages, because yeah, the show is we appreciate is that. That's going to be our main goal. Fan fiction can go where the show can't. Right. We appreciate that. It can be like, yeah. people are swearing and whatever. And I'm like, that's... That's not okay for kids. We're going to try and filter that as much as we can. And then we've also chatted with you about some of at least the mini articles that you've been, essays you've been writing for us on Twitter. Just off the cuff, 900 word essay. Right. Be able to write some stuff for us and include that in the Whelmed article archive as well. And it's not just about shipping and that kind of thing, but um, you talk about a wide range of things that I really appreciate. So I would really like to get some of that out there for other people to read. Of course. Thank you so much for coming into the cave and spending some time with us, Emily. Where can people find you? On Earth Prime. Probably the easiest place to find me right now is my Twitter, which is at Emily of Arden, E M I L Y of A R D E N. Whenever I do other things on the internet and other creative endeavors that I want to share with people, I try to share them there because. Unlike a lot of people on the show, I don't have my own podcast or giant uh, creative endeavor. Someday, someday in the future. But whenever I do little mini things, I try to share them there. If anyone is interested in reading my thoughts on whatever, 
Fantastic. And we're also going to get some scans of your <laughs> notes from five years ago <laughs> and get those online somewhere as well. <laughs> All right. Thanks to everyone for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com crashing the mode, and on our website, www.crashingthemode.com. Emily and fans like her and you make the Young Justice community what it is. As buried in fandom as I have been my entire life, I am constantly fascinated by the seemingly infinite variety there is in how fans choose to enjoy a show, a movie, a book, a comic through their own filters, and how in our modern age they're able to express it and share it and create communities. Fan fiction, shipping, cosplaying, essays, doctoral theses, classes on mythology, and I suppose podcasts about gaming and writing all fall into these categories. If you are active on social media, I highly recommend you follow Emily. Her own deep dives, as I've mentioned, into the shipping and everything else in the show are like a missing puzzle piece to our show, and I can't wait to read more about what she has to offer. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on iTunes, Google play or your podcatcher of choice the ratings really help other people find our show if you do leave us a rating let us know especially if you're outside the u.s we have to look a little harder for those if you'd like to support the show financially in getting more reviews discussions interviews and so much more please consider linking over to www.patreon.com slash crashing the mode and pledging a few dollars a month to the show as a thank you, we're offering access to our episode outlines, Young Justice-inspired role-playing game adventures, in-depth articles on subjects we've only touched on in the show, including upcoming articles from Emily herself, I hope, uh, a free copy of the Masks RPG from Magpie Games, and the opportunity to play in a quarterly superhero-inspired RPG session run by us. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag Keep Binging YJ on Netflix. Hashtag Buy YJ Comics on Comixology. And get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, Stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Um, so, um, funny that you should say that um, you don't, unlike other people on the show, you don't really have like a podcast and stuff, <laughs> because um, Caleb actually may not be able to do season two with me. <laughs> And I would like to invite you to be my co-hosts on season two if you are interested in something like that. <laughs> um, that would be amazing. Uh, I'd awesome. <laughs> we can think of, you can think about it a little bit. Um, this was a little bit. Sorry, this was a little bit of kind of a like an interview. We had been thinking about a lot of different options. Also, to be perfectly blunt, I want there's a very specific kind of person I was looking for. I really wanted to have Caleb's younger than I am. He has a different perspective. He hasn't read the comics that I do, and it gives that dynamic that we need for the show uh, that I can't provide myself, and that so that we have a different perspective on what's going on. So that was one Absolutely. thing. I really liked the things that you have been putting on Twitter and the things you've been sharing with us showed me that you can really articulate some very interesting points about what's going on. Thank and you. to be to be to be blunt, I really wanted to have a, a, a woman on the show. <laughs> like I loved having Darcy on and and Cat Cools coming up, and I just thought, God, I, if I could find all of these check boxes, it would be great. And as you and I were talking, I was thinking, I think Emily might be someone we want to do this with. And, um, you know, so when we were doing the recording, I was like, yeah, I think we're going to do this. I think I would like to have that happen. So if it's something that you might consider, then let's talk about it. Um, Caleb and Neil want to listen to the recording and Neil's going to edit everything up, of course. If there's anything you need to cut, because I know I ramble a bit, feel free. 
I, no, Neil makes me Neil makes me sound very articulate, so don't <laughs> worry about it. Like he's a genius when that's concerned. So is this is that something you might be interested in doing? I would love to. I would absolutely love to. 